Wow. So I, I, fair to say after Billy Joel and the Greenwich Town Party, this <laughs> is the next hot ticket. Good evening and thank you for joining us. I'm Ken Bloom and my wife, Abby Meiselman and I are proud residents of Greenwich and we are pleased and delighted to welcome you to Authors Live at Greenwich Library. This series is made possible through the support of Greenwich Library Board of Trustees and by contributions from generous donors. Before we begin, the library has asked me to remind you to please keep your mask on at all times. Please silence your cell phone and refrain from using it and from taking any photos during the event. And also books will be available for sale and signing after the event outside the theater, thanks to our very own Diane's Books. Our moderator this evening is Sarah Lyle, writer at large for the New York Times, writing for the sports, culture, media, and international desks. I became acquainted with Sarah's writing after I read her recent article in the New York Times entitled, Why is Everyone So Angry? In that article, Sarah explored the now prevalent COVID-related phenomenon of the abusive relationship between customer and customer service agent. Sarah, thank you for raising this topic to everyone's attention. May your writing bring out the best in us. Now, Sarah will be interviewing Congressman Jamie Raskin. Congressman Raskin is my brother-in-law. And... Mm. <laughs> And it's for this reason that I've been asked to make this introduction. <laughs> now, I assume you know Jamie's biography. You know that he represents Maryland's eighth congressional district in the US House of Representatives. And you know he is a survivor of the insurrection of the US Capitol, the insurrection which was incited by a former twice impeached president. And you know that Jamie led the second impeachment of that one term former president. And you also know his story of our losing Tommy, our nephew, to the evil disease of depression. So before we begin, let me tell you something you don't know about Congressman Raskin. Well, you know he's a progressive Democrat, but you didn't know that I was a former Republican, but am now a moderate Democrat. <laughs> now, as a former Republican, you can imagine that I would have quite the collection of work ties. These are things that people wear in the business workplace. And as a progressive Democrat, you can understand why Jamie might have very few ties. To us, the more liberal you are, the less formal is your wardrobe. And so it was no surprise to my wife, Abby, and I that on the eve of the launch of Jamie's book, where Jamie would be driving from the Cape to New York City for his first set of interviews, he realized that for all these interviews, he had no ties. <laughs> but wait, Greenwich is on the way. <laughs> and so Uncle Jamie stopped in to see Uncle Kenneth and he loaded up on my ties, which I'm proud to say are the ties that you see when you see Congressman Raskin <laughs> on TV. I will also note he's wearing one of them this evening. <laughs> Please join me in welcoming Congressman Jamie Raskin and Sarah Lyle. Mm -hmm. Actually, I just complimented uh, the Congressman on his tie a few minutes ago, <laughs> and he didn't mention it. At the, all. <laughs> the, the, uh, these are the ties that bind. <laughs> 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 um, it is a huge pleasure to be here in this beautiful library, in this beautiful auditorium, and to be able to do it in person. I really wonderful. Thank you so much for letting me part of this, be, letting me be part of this. Um, and it's a real pleasure too to talk about this extraordinary book um, and to meet Congressman Raskin, who I so admire. I commend the book to everyone. It's beautifully written. It's full of interesting information and it's it's moving and um, harrowing and inspiring all at the same time. It's really great. Um, and I want to talk a little bit about the book and then move the conversation along uh, beyond that. 
And at the end of the evening, everyone else will have a chance to ask questions as well. Um, this book is about trauma in many ways. It's about private trauma and national trauma that you suffered at the same time. Um, and underlying it in my mind is, a, is an existential question that all of us have faced during the pandemic in these last two bewildering years, which is how do you as a positive person, the way you describe yourself in the book, as an optimistic person, how do you move beyond what's happened and find a way forward? How do you find hope in the world right now? And I wanna get back to that maybe at the end of our conversation, but I feel that a lot of what you write here is an effort to answer that question. Um, the book is about two things, uh, the death by suicide of your beloved son, Tommy, on the last day of 2020, and the insurrection of January 6th and its aftermath. Um, and I wonder when you set out to write the book, you really married those two things in a, in a very artful and interesting way. And I wonder what your process was like, what you set out to write and how it ended up the way it is now. Thank you for doing this, Sarah Lyle. Well. <laughs> I appreciate it. Um, thank you all for coming also tonight. And thank you, Kenneth Bloom, Uncle Kenneth, and uh, thank you, Greenwich, Connecticut. And you know, thank you for opening your beautiful town and your beautiful state to me. So I'm delighted to be with you. Um, well, for, for one thing, I mean, the book was a labor of love and uh, and I think it became kind of a love letter to my son and also a love letter to the country. Um, and, um, you know, my um, publisher asked me that question as we were embarking on, how are these two things going to be written about together? But it's really three things if you think about it. It's Tommy, his life, and then our loss of him, and then what happened on January 6th, and then the impeachment trial is kind of a third thing. And so it was even a little more compound than you're suggesting in terms of these different things. But for me, I suppose the unifying dimension was my experience. It was all ha happening to me. Um, and you know, I say in the very first page of the book that these were cosmically distinct events, but utterly intertwined in my psyche and my experience, which they were. Although if I were writing it again today, I think I would see them as even more closely, objectively intertwined than I did when I wrote the book. Because I think that, um, well, it's kind of like your article about why is everybody so angry? I think that COVID-19 uh, was an important framing context for what happened to Tommy, for what happened to the country, and for what happened to us on January 6th. So I'd like to talk about Tommy in a little bit, but let's first talk about what happened on January 6th. Um, it was the day after you buried him and you walked into Congress ready to certify the election. Um, and can you just tell me a little bit about what happened to you personally that day? So, um, yeah, the, the day before was just a profoundly sad, dismal day for us. Um, and uh, so our younger daughter, Tabitha, had been urging me not to go in on January 6th. And uh, I think our older daughter, Hannah, chimed in a bit on that too, but we had tons of relatives around, uncles and aunts and cousins. And, uh, and I explained that this was a constitutional mandate. It's right there in the 12th amendment that um, on the first Wednesday of the first week of January after the presidential election, the House and the Senate meet in joint session. And I said, I basically had no choice. I mean, it was a constitutional directive. Also, Speaker Pelosi had asked me many weeks before to get ready for what we anticipated were gonna be a series of uh, false charges against the casting of electoral college votes from swing states like Pennsylvania, Georgia, Arizona, Michigan, Wisconsin. And so I'd been uh, preparing for that in order to refute all of these uh, you know, outlandish claims. Um, 
And the other thing is that uh, we were in COVID-19 and uh, members were dropping like flies. I mean, every day we would get another email saying representative so-and-so has COVID and can't come. And we, you know, we, there was no procedure for people voting by proxy or voting by distance or on Zoom. And we had a very narrow majority. We have a very narrow majority. Um, and people's family members were coming down with it. And so, you know, I just felt it would be irresponsible for me. And obviously I was completely miserable and devastated, but I would be miserable and devastated wherever I was. And I figured, you know, at least be doing something of some good for the country. And Tommy would, would want me to do that, be doing that. Yeah. So, so there you were, and you describe in the book, and I, I actually hadn't followed as closely as I might have the extraordinary efforts that the Democratic Party had been doing for many months in anticipation of objections by the president. You all very early in the election started preparing for a situation where he would not accept the results. And you describe in the book how you had thought you prepared for every eventuality, but there was one thing you had not prepared for. What was what, going to happen? Yeah. Yeah, I mean, so <laughs> we prepared for uh, everything but reality because, uh, you know, I was still, you know, I'm a professor of constitutional law. I did that for 25 years before I, I came to Congress. And, uh, you know, I was viewing it very much like a set of chess moves within the context of the parliamentary confines of this joint session. And so they would assert this and we would refute with that. And, you know, we, we had the votes to stop them both on the House side and the Senate side if we kept everybody together and we presented reasonable and compelling arguments and so on. And so uh, we knew that there was trouble outside. Uh, I had predicted, and I'd kind of forgotten this a little bit, but in that documentary that was being made separately from many years before, um, the documentary filmmaker caught me saying there was going to be violence, but I just never, it never struck me that the violence would get inside and that the violent intersection, the violent insurrection would intersect with this attempt at a political coup, which was what was taking place. Did you get a sense as you came to Congress that day that the air was different outside in the Capitol? Yeah, I mean, I record some of the episodes mm -hmm of driving in and, you know, people giving us the finger and, you know, yelling at the cars. I saw some crazy bumper stickers. One uh, with, I think it was a Delaware license plate said, uh, if, if guns are outlawed, how am I gonna shoot liberals? Uh, you know, some stuff like that. Yeah. So it, it wasn't just an average day uh, in, in Washington, but it, it was under COVID strictures. And so, um, you know, this is an unremarked aspect of what took place there. Um, it, it could have been, I mean, there were so many different ways it could have been a far more pervasive nightmare than it was. And it was a nightmare with 150 officers wounded and injured and uh, six or seven deaths, depending on how you're counting people who took their own lives in the wake of it. Um, but, uh, you know, if, had, if we had not been under COVID conditions, we would have had hundreds or thousands more people in the building. Yeah. And it would have been much more difficult to get all of us out to evacuate the members and the staff members who were there. And my family was one of only a handful. Vice President Pence had a few people there. I think Speaker Pelosi had a few family members there. I had uh, Tabitha and my then new son-in-law, Hank, who had eloped with our daughter, Hannah, in one of those Elvis Presley weddings uh, <laughs> under COVID-19 uh, in the summer. Did they actually go to Las Vegas? They were in Nevada when it <laughs> happened, so yeah. So anyway, that's a different issue. That's it. <laughs> but um, <laughs> we're still working on that. We're gonna, uh, but, um, you know, there, there weren't that many people there. Yeah. And so it made it a lot easier for the, these heroic officers to save our lives. But of course, that added to your own uh, trauma that day because your daughter was there. And, and it sounded like, you know- it, Tabitha didn't... and Hank were up in the gallery at yeah. the beginning because they wanted to come and see me speak and debate and you know contest the whole thing. And then after I did my part, they went back to Steny Hoyer's 
side office off of the house floor. And it was, I think about 20 minutes later that all hell broke loose. And somebody sent me the photograph of the insurrectionist bearing the Confederate battle flag in Statuary Hall. I went over and I showed that to Liz Cheney, who was sitting right across the aisle from me. I said, Liz, look, we're under new management here. And she, she said, oh my God, what have they done? And uh, you know, it just got worse and worse. Um, the Speaker Pelosi was evacuated. The, the Republican leaders, Democratic leaders were evacuated, taken out. Uh, there was screaming. A lot of my Democratic colleagues were yelling at the Republicans, you did this, you asked for this call off your stormtroopers, all that kind of stuff. The, um, our new house chaplain, who was on her uh, third day on the job, um, <laughs> got up and made a really beautiful prayer uh, for uh, deliverance and for peace um, that was interrupted. My colleague, Jim McGovern from Massachusetts, uh, who took over at the dais, tried to keep things going, but it was just impossible. And then they told us to put on our gas masks and. Uh, we didn't really know we had gas masks, but they were <laughs> under the chair. And of course, nobody knew how to work them. And they just emitted this just sickening, buzzing, kind of nauseating noise. Um, Why do gas masks make noise? I don't know. Yeah, I don't know. <laughs> but anyway, I mean, there was a lot, you know, there was tear gas that was being used by the officers to try to repel people. But the insurrectionist forces and the a lot of the people in the mob had brought tear gas, bear mace, um, unknown chemical agents. And you know, you, you may have seen the picture of uh, Officer Hodges, who was the cop who got caught in the doorway, who was screaming and they sprayed some unknown chemical in his face for minutes. Uh, I mean, the courage of that guy is just absolutely remarkable. He was tortured basically in front of the entire world they were beating him up, smashing him in the face, spraying him with this gas. And then when they finally dislodged him and took him back and they threw water, just bottles of water in his face to clear everything out, he went back out and fought for two hours wow. more. Wow. And you think about the bravery of these people. And I've got colleagues who will cannot even summon up the courage to vote for an investigation into what happened. Well, that's one of the things I want to talk to you a bit about is, you know, the moment we all saw that happening, it felt like all of you were in this together, all the people in Congress, all of you were under siege. And looking from the outside, it seemed like a moment where you would have to come together and agree on what had happened. And one of the things that's been so extraordinary is how most Republicans now essentially deny what happened. And I wonder if you felt then at that moment that this would be something that could bring people together finally in the country. Um, and, and when that sort of changed. Well, I mean, I write in the book about this kind of fantastical notion that floated through my head because when I got up to speak and I thanked everyone for their kindness and their sympathy and flowers and stuff, everybody got up and clapped and I was so taken aback by the whole thing. And I, this kind of crazy idea went through my head that maybe the loss of Tommy would, um, would make them accept the presidential election and say, you know what, let's, let's just, uh, let's get back to the union. And uh, I mean, it was utterly fantastical. I mean, that was the state of mind I was in, I suppose. Um, so, uh, yeah, that's it's been a it's been a very tough pill to swallow. I, you know, you got to understand the complexity of the events taking place on January sixth, and the way that I try to lay it out is that there were three rings of sedition essentially taking place, and it was a mob riot surrounding a violent insurrection surrounding a coup, and at the level of the mob riot, you had tens of thousands of people who came with lots of different reasons and different motivations for what uh, then President Trump called a wild protest. And a lot of them just thought innocently, let's go to Washington and do what the president's gonna ask us to do and the president will be responsible. Some uh, undoubtedly arrived with uh, dreams of violence and attack and so on, um, but it became a mob riot. And um, you know, we had officers with broken jaws, broken noses, broken necks, broken vertebrae, broken arms, fingers, legs, one cop lost three fingers. Uh, Officer Fanon had a heart attack 
he was grabbed and thrown around in the crowd like you know you'd see like in a mosh pit at a rock concert people hitting him spitting him punching him uh, they were using confederate battle flags american flags trump flags to beat up our officers to spear them um, and many ended up with traumatic uh, brain injuries post-traumatic stress syndrome you know my district borders washington dc and i've got a lot of constituents who are officers either on the capitol force or the Metropolitan Police Department force, or who came over from Montgomery County, who are still um, in physical therapy or mental therapy. Okay, so that was the outer ring of the riot. Then the middle ring was the ring of the insurrection. And that included people from the Proud Boys, who you'll recall Donald Trump had told to stand back and stand by at the first presidential debate. The members of the Oath Keepers, who've been charged with uh, in conspiracy to insurrection um, or seditious conspiracy, which means conspiracy to overthrow the government. Um, the three percenters, the Aryan nations, the QAnon networks, the various militia groups, um, the First Amendment comitatus. I mean, lo lots of different groups were in there. The Unification Church, there were religious cults. And these people came organized as a kind of paramilitary army of frontline stormtroopers to smash our windows, knock down our doors, and to begin the violent assault on the officers. Okay, that was not the scariest ring. Okay, the scariest ring was the very central ring, which was the ring of the coup. And coup is an odd word to use in the American political parlance because we don't have a lot of experience with coups in our country. Um, and we think of a coup as something that takes place against a president, but this was a coup orchestrated by the president against the vice president and against the Congress, which is why the crowd, when they got to us in the House of Representatives, was chanting, hang Mike Pence, hang Mike Pence, as well as where's Nancy, um, and you know we're going to get her, and we want Trump and all that. Well, Trump had refused to accept the results of the 2020 presidential election. And he had been preparing his followers not to accept those results. He'd been saying all over the country, the only way I can lose this election is if there's fraud. Yeah. It's gotta be a scam. And when it, he was asked, would he accept the results of the election? He would say, we're gonna wait and see what happens. Um, so, I mean, he, he's not someone who's exactly discreet about his intentions. And so you could see where he was going. Um, and afterwards, they brought, um, I think, erroneously as a political matter, 60 different lawsuits. And this was the most legitimate thing they did because in America, anybody can sue anybody and they will, you know? And so he brought 60 different lawsuits, but what it established was this comprehensive, meticulous record refuting every claim of electoral corruption, every claim of electoral fraud they were making. And every judge rejected um, either as a matter of substance and fact or as a matter of law, what they were asserting, including eight judges that Donald Trump had himself nominated at the federal bench. So from there, there were just a series of tactics of escalating illegitimacy. So first, we'll go to the state legislatures and we'll get them just to nullify the popular vote and to instate electoral college slates devoted to Donald Trump. When the GOP legislatures refused to do that in states like Pennsylvania and Wisconsin, at that point, he upped the ante. He said, we're going to call the election officials themselves, like Brad Raffensperger in Georgia, the Secretary of State, and we're going to tell them to find us votes. And Trump is recorded in that phone call saying to Raffensperger, just find us 11,780 votes. I know they're there. That's all we want. He wasn't there to try to stop election fraud. He was trying to commit election fraud. That's what he was doing on that phone call, which is why the prosecutors in Georgia are after him now, because it's an hour detailed discussion of him trying to create a conspiracy to perpetrate a fraud against the voters of Georgia. But amazingly, Brad Raffensperger, an unsung constitutional hero, said no. And 30 different election officials said no, that we are aware of. So at that point, there were a couple other side maneuvers with Rudy Giuliani, like, you know, let's just send out the military, seize the election machinery, 
have the military rerun the election, which is not exactly in the constitution. Uh, and, um, but none of that stuff worked. So then it all came down to Mike Pence. We will get Mike Pence to declare extra constitutional powers, powers that don't exist in the constitution that no vice president has ever claimed before to unilaterally nullify electoral college votes coming in from Arizona, from Georgia and Pennsylvania. The purpose there was to lower Joe Biden's majority in the electoral college of 306 to below 270. And what would that do? Going below 270 would trigger instantly, immediately the 12th amendment says a contingent election under the 12th amendment. Well, a contingent election in the house of representatives, why would Trump wants Speaker Pelosi and a Democratic majority deciding um, who the next president is going to be. Well, under the 12th Amendment, we don't vote one member, one vote. We vote one state, one vote. And after the 2020 elections, they knew they had 27 state delegations that were controlled by the GOP. The Democrats have 22. We have 22. Pennsylvania, nine to nine, split right down the middle off the field, so 27 to 22. Even had they lost, my, uh, my new best friend, the at-large representative from Wyoming, Liz Cheney, uh, in, in, their, in that vote, they still would have had 26 votes, 26 to 23 or 26 to 22 to two. Um, they would have declared Donald Trump uh, the president uh, for the next four years. They would have seized the presidency and he likely would have invoked the Insurrection Act, which is what his disgraced former national security advisor, Michael Flynn, had been urging him to do, to declare martial law, to finally release the National Guard, bring them in, and then say, I'm gonna put down all of this chaos that he had unleashed against us. That was basically the plan. And so you gotta look and see how these three levels of activity were interacting on that day. And a lot of that is the work of the select committee on January 6th, how was all of this financed? How was it organized? Who was coordinating it? So it, this was not some kind of spontaneous eruption of popular feeling. This was a planned attack on American democracy that we just narrowly escaped. Were you scared at the moment um, about what Vice President Pence would do? I was scared beforehand, but when we got out onto the floor at 1 p.m. on January 6th, a memo was being distributed. There was a, a big stir. I saw there was a lot of discussion and consternation on the GOP side of the aisle. Uh, and I got the memo and I sped read it. And uh, it, it was amazing for two reasons. One was it was a very emphatic statement by Vice President Pence. He had no power to reject and rebuff electoral college votes. He was being asked to do something that was completely outside of his capacity. And it, competence as vice president. But what was amazing was that he essentially laid out what Donald Trump was trying to get him to do. Um, and so the essential contours of the coup dimension were clear to us right at that moment. Um, and if we'd been able to get through it just on the parliamentary level, it would have been you know, an extremely troubling day, but it would not have been the nightmare it became when the insurrection and the coup merged and all hell broke loose. And people from his office are cooperating with your inquiry, aren't they? Well, for, um, well um, yeah, I mean, overwhelmingly, we've had good voluntary cooperation. Um, I, you know, and I, uh, Obviously, my politics are different from those of Mike Pence, but I have described him as a constitutional patriot on that day, someone who upheld his oath of office, and he was a hero on that day just for doing his job against incredible pressure that was being brought down against him. Having said that, uh, you know, the very first day I got elected to public office, I took office in the state Senate in Maryland, a politician, somebody made a speech and I said, wow, that was a great speech. He seems like a great guy. And he said, I wanna teach you a lesson on your first day in public office. He said, nobody is ever as good as they look or as bad as they look, okay? So, uh, <laughs> you know, we're just normal human beings like everybody else. And, uh, you know, Pence, uh, I think did a very good job on that day, but I think he has also been trying to do what he can to, 
um, ingratiate himself again with Trump's supporters uh, and Trump's followers. And that means he's not speaking out clearly the way, uh, for example, Liz Cheney is. And I think Liz is telling the truth to the country about what we're living through and what the stakes are. And so she will live forever in my mind as a constitutional patriot. But someone like him, do you feel he's scared of what the Trump people would do to him? Or do you feel it's an ideological thing? What's going on? I don't on? know. If they were screaming, hang Sarah Lyle, how would you feel about it? You know, I mean, that it, like that it got very real that day yeah. for us. You know, it, um, I mean, we grew up with the idea that politics in America is exceptional, I guess, in the sense that we're not subject to fascism and authoritarianism and mob violence and all those things. And that's not what makes us exceptional. It's very clear to me now. What makes us exceptional is that the majority of the American people in this beautiful, multiracial, multi-ethnic, multi-religious constitutional democracy are committed to creating a more perfect union and are willing to struggle to do it. But uh, you know, we have had uh, profound demons in our history going back to the very beginning. And we didn't begin as you know, Lincoln's beautiful vision of a government of the people, by the people, for the people. We began as a slave republic of white male property owners. Um, and so we've been bedeviled by violent white supremacy from the beginning of the country. But you can read our 17 constitutional amendments since the Bill of Rights as a chronicle of the progress of the country, which is just remarkable in such a relatively short period of time. You know, we abolish slavery in the 13th Amendment, we get equal protection and due process in the 14th Amendment, we ban race discrimination and voting in the 15th Amendment, in the 17th Amendment, we move from election of US senators by the legislatures to the people, the 19th Amendment doubles the franchise, counting women in with women's suffrage, the 23rd Amendment says people in DC can be part of presidential elections, the 24th Amendment bans poll taxes, 26th Amendment lowers the voting age to 18. All of it is expanding the meaning of democracy, deepening the meaning of democracy. And Tocqueville said in Democracy in America that in this country that he was looking at, that he was so amazed by, democracy and voting rights are either shrinking and shriveling away or they're growing and expanding. And we've just been in a contractionary mode where we have the voting rights and democracy have been under attack and we've got to get back uh, on the growth road. Are you confident that we will? I feel like we will. And, um, you know, for, forgive me for, you know, sounding partisan here. I don't, I, you know, I, I know I'm not in the House of Representatives. I'm in a library. So I'm trying to, I'm trying to sound as nonpartisan as possible. It's awkward, but, uh, it, um, you know, the, look, Hillary, and, and by the way, I, I love the Republican Party. I, I've got a bust on my desk that my grandfather gave me of Abraham Lincoln, the founder of the Republican Party. And uh, uh, my favorite Supreme Court justices have been uh, Republican appointees. Justice Stevens, I loved, you know, who Ford nominated. Justice Souter, who is a, so I, I don't consider myself a really partisan person, you know, and, and I don't, I don't consider Donald Trump like the, you know, the epitome of a Republican either. I mean, he was a Democrat, he was an independent. I think he wanted to run for president on the Reform Party ticket. So, I, you know, it's too bad for them that he ended up with them. But, uh, <laughs> you know, I, I don't view the Republican Party anymore under Trump's control like uh, a major modern political party or Lincoln's party anymore. I view it as an authoritarian cult of personality, like a religious or political cult where one person tells everybody what to think. And the cost of being part of that party is that uh, you have to abandon your critical thinking skills. I mean, that's not what it means to be in a political party. I mean, we might go in the other direction where you know everybody's fighting all the time and all that, but I mean, at least we are a political party and we're, we're not a cult of personality. Um, so will we get out of it? Yeah, I, you know, in the second impeachment trial, I, I would say to the Republicans I spoke to, you gotta, you gotta convict because that's what the evidence tells us. You gotta convict for America, you gotta convict for the constitution and you gotta convict for your party because he will destroy your party. You know, the party of Lincoln cannot survive as the party of Trump. Uh, and you know, that they, there were 10 Republicans who voted to impeach. There were seven 
Republican senators who voted to convict from New England, the Midwest, the South, the West, Alaska. Um, that's, you know, 10 senators out of 50, uh, you know, um, I'm sorry, there were 10, Republic, 10 Republicans in the House, seven uh, senators. So that's 14% of the Republicans. I mean, they can't afford to lose 14% of their people. You know, that, that, that's a losing proposition for them. And this is the importance of what Liz Cheney and Adam Kinzinger and Mitt Romney and the others have done. They've said, we're gonna take a stand. We're not, we don't want our political party to be based on lies, propaganda, disinformation, conspiracy theory. I mean, that, that's a form of mass derangement when you have tens of millions of people denying what happened in the presidential election. I mean, our team just lost an election in Virginia for governor. And you know that bummed everybody out, but we didn't storm the Virginia state capitol and beat up a lot of police officers and smash them in the face with flagpoles and lie about it. We didn't do that. You could view this as the chief responsibility of a political party in a constitutional democracy. You go, you fight like cats and dogs in the election, but when it's over, you accept the election. Or if you want, if you think you got a serious issue, you go to court, you lose that, okay. Remember Vice President Gore in 2000? He said, all right, we've lost this. Uh, he made some jokes about it. I mean, even in 2016, where it was well established um, that Vladimir Putin was orchestrating a, cam a campaign of cyber sabotage with you know, attacks on the DNC and uh, the RNC, Hillary Clinton's office, all of it. Um, you know, what did our side do? You know, we put on pink hats and we had a million people rally in Washington uh, nonviolently and we didn't beat anybody up or orchestrate violence against the government. I think that that's the responsible way to go. But how does it work you know? if one side um, uh, works within the law and the other won't? How do you how do you handle that situation? Well, that's a good problem to raise <laughs> uh, because I'm researching that. I mean, if you look at the history of coups, like in Greece or Italy or Argentina or Chile in '73 with the, against uh, Allende, the Pinochet. Could you look at these coups? Um, essentially. The, the left broadly defined, the liberal and progressive parties cannot defeat fascism on their own. The ones, when you defeat fascism, it's a coalition between the left parties and the center right. Uh, and so, you know, uh, uh, the members of my party who, you know, this is something I think I was mentioning to you earlier, Sarah. I mean, this now is not the time for ideological purity tests and political correctness. You know, it's not a time to be, um, you know, censoring other people's language, for example. You know, not everybody, you know, most Americans don't even get to go to college, much less Oberlin or, you know, a place where you're gonna learn all of the, you know, all of the authentically most up-to-date ways of you know, speaking about things. And so that's not gonna work for us. Like the Democratic Party has gotta be the party of democracy broadly understood. And we are, I mean, we're the party of the Roosevelt's who saw fascists and Nazis marching down the street in Europe and they didn't see very fine people on both sides, right? They knew exactly what America needed to do. That's the spirit of democracy we need to reclaim. And, you know, I noticed in looking at Ukraine, I mean, this is just a classic situation. I mean, Putin said the other day that uh, he's just, he wants to rescue the ethnic Russians who are caught in Ukraine, which is just a resounding historical echo of Hitler saying he wanted to rescue ethnic Germans in Czechoslovakia and the Sudetenland, right? So, we see exactly what's going on. That's an authoritarian power trying to attack a democracy just for being a sovereign democratic republic. And of course, uh, our former president gets up and what does he see in what Vladimir Putin is doing? Genius, says he's a genius. Um, so these battle lines are clearly drawn. Donald Trump wants to come back to power in America. There's no doubt about it in my mind. And 
They're down there at Mar-a-Lago planning all of the pardon political criminals, Steve Bannon and Dinesh D'Souza, and all of them are figuring out a way to get him back into power. And every corrupt authoritarian government on earth, starting with Vladimir Putin in Russia and Orban in Hungary and Al-Sisi in Egypt and Duterte in the Philippines and Bolsonaro in Brazil, the homicidal crown prince of Saudi Arabia, all of them are rooting for Donald Trump to come back in office. And a lot of them owe him also for various dirty deals that he did while he was president of the United States. So democracy um, is in crisis around the world and we are in the fight of our lives here. And uh, I saw that clearly on January 6th and I saw it in the trial and I feel it right now, which is uh, why I feel, you know, this gives me the, the purpose to go on and to act with um, the memory and spirit of my son very much in my heart. Um, you write about that in the book. Can you go, I still hear me. Um, you write about in the book how you felt that as you decided to take on the very difficult task of leading the impeachment, the second impeachment. And you didn't have to do that. You were grief stricken. You had gone through a lot of um, trauma at home. H how did thinking about Tommy help impel you to go forward with that? Well, Tommy left us um, a farewell note um, which, I mean, it, it was heartbreaking for us to receive it, but it has been um, kind of a salvation of a, of a communication to us because he said, um, please forgive me, my illness won today. Look after each other, the animals and the global poor for me. All my love, Tommy. Uh, and it's the first thing, you know, that, Sarah and I read when we wake up in the morning. It's the last thing we see when we go to bed at night. We keep it on our dresser. Um, and uh, it's kind of a guide to living. And the three most important words to my mind, at least now in my thinking about it, are all my love, because he gave all of his love every day to the world. And in some sense, uh, because he felt the pain of the world and the suffering of human beings and of animals so intensely, um, it was too much for him, you know? He just, it was too much for him. But there's nothing in the note about, you know, take a few years off, uh, <laughs> you know, lick your wounds. Uh, I mean, and Tommy also, for you know those lucky enough to have known him, uh, Tommy was like the funniest, happiest person you'd ever meet. You know, he was the life of the party. He was a poet, he was a playwright. Um, he was the king of Boggle. Do you guys play Boggle ever? I mean, he would teach you Boggle in a minute. He would also turn you into vegan in about five minutes. Uh, but um, he, um, I mean, you go through something like this and it's a nightmare for your family and we were drowning in grief and sorrow, but we know that's not what Tommy wanted for us. Um, it looks like we're getting to the end. I'm very sorry I didn't have time to talk about a lot of things I wanted to talk about. But I was talking too much. No, 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 you're supposed to. Know. No, but getting back to what I what I was bringing up in the beginning, and I do really want to ask you about this. You describe in the beginning of the book how you've always been a radical optimist. You've thought the best of people. You've thought the best of our system. You have had a sunny, um, happy disposition. Um, how do you feel having been tested so much in this past year? Um, how do you go on and, and do you feel that optimism is coming back to you? I mean, I do feel that optimism because I'm in touch with a lot of young people. I get a lot of letters and emails from young people, you know, Tommy's friends and his peers and his generation. And I place a lot of hope uh, in them. Um, my father always used to say to us, if everything looks hopeless, you're the hope. Uh, and so I see a lot of hope in that generation. And uh, I also, I take a lot of solace from um, the prior generations of Americans who confronted 
things even worse than what we're confronting today. And we're brave and we're tough and they maintain their humanity. They maintain their humor uh, even while they fought for really important things. I mean, we can never forget that democracy has been very much the exception in the history of humankind. And most people have lived under dictators and kings and queens and autocrats and people like Vladimir Putin and Donald Trump. And um, we don't want to do that. America is about self-government, this great experiment. And it's not just about what goes on in Washington. It's about what, what goes on everywhere in all of our institutions. What are they going to be like? Are we going to become a society of book banners and book burners and people who try to destroy public health measures? I mean, is that who we are as a country? And I, I don't believe that we're a racist country. I don't believe we're an anti-Semitic country. I don't believe we're a country of misogynists and um, immigrant bashers and all of that stuff. But um, it's no time for complacency. People have got to stand up wherever they are in every institution and keep us moving forward. Yes. <laughs> Um, now, this nice lady is walking around with a microphone. So if anyone has questions, please make yourself known. Hello. Can everyone hear me? OK. Um, thank you so, mu so much for being here. Um, I just wanted to ask, um, you know, what legacy would you like to have? And how can those of us in the room who share your values and your interests help you achieve that? Wow. Uh... <laughs> I, I was hoping I wasn't old enough to have a legacy. Uh, <laughs> um, you know, um, well, I would like uh, I would like to be part of a movement of people who um, safeguard democratic institutions and strengthen them and strengthen our values. And I'd like to be known as, uh, yeah, a good dad, a good family man. So you can help me out. Yeah, so. <laughs> I, I want to thank you for coming out, Professor Raskin. I'm a, a fan of your early work, We the Students. Um, oh, that wrote, book's being banned in Texas right now. As, as it should be, of course, right. So um, that, that brings me to my question. We've been using this uh, in class for many years, and I'm curious about, first, um, what got you interested in school law? And second, what you would say to teachers like myself and our colleagues in the face of, you know, mouse is bad and, 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 and those type of things. Uh, I think you've touched on it a little bit already, yeah. but I'd love to hear the pep talk from the great Professor Askin. No, thank you, man. <laughs> thanks, for, thanks for teaching that book. Uh, and um, well, I mean, that, that, that's, it's a funny story because I got a call from some students at Blair High School, which was actually the, the school where Tommy went, but it was when he was a little boy, but these high school kids called me and they said um, they had a monthly cable TV show on the Montgomery County Public uh, Cable Channel, the school system channel uh, called Shades of Grey, where they would have a debate. Uh, and this was, I think, 1997. And they had a debate about the scandalous topic of should gay and lesbian people be allowed to get married? Um, and they had two conservatives and two liberals, and it was a totally cordial debate and the school system censored it because they said that the public was not ready for uh, the, this sensitive topic. And so um, uh, they, they called me up and they said, you know, can they do this? Can they just not, we have an agreement for them to run the show. Can they do this? And I said, well, it kind of depends on why they're not running it. Is, are they not running it because they need it for the time for the superintendent to talk about homework or something? Or is it because they're disagreeing with uh, the content of the speech. And so the, the kids wrote back and they, um, you know, asked what was going on. And they got back this really indignant response from uh, the official in charge saying, well, you can tell Professor Raskin that our reasons for not running Shades of Grey have nothing to do with the content of the speech, but everything to do with what those speakers were saying. <laughs> uh, <laughs> and so... I said, now, you don't get a smoking gun in a First Amendment case like that, you know. So I took their case. We won that case. They reversed the censorship. They, you know, they had to run the show like 
I think it was 13 times. Uh, and it was only going to run once and nobody ever watched their channel anyway. Uh, and they got a lot of publicity for what they were doing. But that, that's when I realized that the schools that should be teaching young people about the Constitution, about the Bill of Rights, are trampling the rights of students. And so I, and I looked and nobody had written a book about uh, the rights of students. Uh, and when I looked at it through this prism, I saw that a remarkable percentage of the important Supreme Court decisions like Brown versus Board of Education, for example, are written about public schools, which are really our chief public institution. And so I wrote this book sponsored by the Supreme Court Historical Society about the rights of students in all of these cases, locker searches, drug testing, censorship of newspaper and yearbooks, prayer in the, in the school huddle, all of that kind of stuff. And now it's being censored by Texas. <laughs> and I, you know, there's some reporter called me from down there and said, there, they, there's a bill to censor uh, your book. I said, please tell them to read chapter two before they censor <laughs> it about the First Amendment. So, <laughs> but, but thank you. I, that's how I got into it. And thanks for, we, we, you know, we need a massive infusion of constitutional and civic literacy. And it's going to be teachers like you that make it happen all across the country. Because what we're suffering from, I mean, you know, I've, I've diagnosed some of the people I think are at fault, but how do you have tens of millions of people follow the, uh, the, the nonsense, the gibberish and the propaganda, you know? Hi, what do you think Democrats can do to reconnect with so many voters who've left the party or voted independent or Republican? Well, thank you. I, you know, um, I'll tell you what, what I'm doing. Uh, I don't run a, like a traditional campaign anymore. I spend no money on pollsters, on TV, on radio, on any of that stuff. My campaign is called Democracy Summer. We bring in high school and college kids. We train them on the history of social change that's taken place in the country. And then we train them on how to register people to vote, how to educate voters, uh, how to canvas, how to do digital organizing, and then we go out and do it. It's been adopted by the Democratic Congressional Campaign Committee. Uh, this summer, I'm going to have 60 colleagues that are doing Democracy Summer with me across the country. And uh, we're going to have a lot of people in also districts with Republican members where we're going to be doing Democracy Summer. So we're saying to this young generation, we need you. We need you to get educated. I mean, it's a remarkable generation. They are beyond racism and anti-Semitism and sexism and they're also a little bit beyond grammar too but that's <laughs> a, a different problem you know uh but they, they are going to save us these young people are going to save us um so the, i think that's where we need to go and then in terms of you know older people who've become disenchanted i just want to say look we've got our imperfections we got our flaws but there's no contest here. We are the party of democracy. We built social security, we built Medicare, we built Medicaid. You know, I had a conversation with uh, one of my colleagues, a Republican who left, I think in somewhat a bit of despair, I would say, uh, after two years of Donald Trump trade Gowdy from South Carolina and on his way out, he said to me, you know, there was like people were saying goodbye and I, you know, said goodbye, I said some nice stuff about him and he said, you know, I said, the problem with you, Raskin, is you're a liberal. I said, you know, you're damn right I'm a liberal. The heart of the word liberal is liberty. And if we're not for liberty, what are we fighting for? And I said, and I'm a progressive because the heart of that word is progress. And if we're not making progress, what are we doing? But I really stuck it to him because I said, you know, my favorite thing to call myself today is a conservative because I want to conserve the land, the air, the water, the climate system, the constitution, the bill of rights, the social security, Medicare, Medicaid, and so on. We're the party defending all of the political traditions in the country because nihilism is not one of our political traditions. You know? so, you know. uh, Ronald Reagan famously said, in order to eat a do dog, you need a dog. So traditionally, the bad guys like Adolf Hitler and Stalin, they won because they were tough and the good people were soft. So don't you think that we need a good guy who is tough in order to deal with Trump and so forth? I mean, it's just a profound question that you ask. I, I quote my grandfather, who was a, a state senator, uh, which is how I knew I kind of had uh, 
politics, you know, running in my veins. Uh, but my, my grandfather used to say, um, duck hunting is a lot of fun until the ducks start shooting back. <laughs> Uh, and I think that captures somewhat the same spirit of what you're saying. Uh, ben Franklin said, uh, if you make yourself a sheep, the wolves will eat you. Um, and so we can't be sheep. That doesn't mean we have to turn ourselves into a mirror image of depraved and evil people, but it does mean that we've got to stand very tough in situations like Ukraine and Tibet, Taiwan, Hong Kong, for you know, free people who are trying to stand up against bullies and tyrants. And uh, this is why those Capitol officers are heroes to me, um, because they stood strong. Um, and the members who went back in, despite the fears of there being a bomb and all the death threats and everything, um, they did their job too, you know? So uh, I, I agree with you. Congressman, first, thanks for coming to town tonight. Uh, second, after Donald Trump uh, lost by 8 million votes, that's the applause line here, folks. <laughs> yeah. Um, and, and, yeah. There uh, were some extraordinary moves that happened at the Pentagon, including Esper being out at Defense Secretary and an unconfirmed guy named Chris Miller, who we really don't know very much about, a bunch of newness people. Is the smoking gun in here? I know you can't talk about what the committee's doing, but it sure seems like they didn't come to the Calvary when you needed them for four hours. Well, the committee is definitely trying to disentangle the different threads of that story. Um, and there was an effort by Trump, which we saw on June 2nd of 2020, to begin to drag the military into his delusions of seizing the presidency again. That was the day, uh, June 1st, that was the day when uh, he and Attorney General Barr, who had not yet opened his eyes and, you know, woken up and left the cult, uh, he, and, he and the Attorney General had basically staged a paramilitary assault on Black Lives Matter protesters in Lafayette Square. Um, and um, I think that was a wake-up call for a lot of people in the military. Uh, and so there were different things going on there. And we're going to try to figure all of that out and tell that story. Obviously, the, um, the, the law abiding nature of the military is essential to the rule of law in a constitutional democracy. The independence of the military from political control uh, and partisan missions, but also their fidelity to the country, the government and the nation and not to one guy. Um, but it's a complicated situation when uh, somebody, you know, is the commander in chief, not of the country, not of the government, but of the army and the navy when called into actual service of the country in times of war insurrection. Uh, and, uh, you know, my GOP colleagues are on the case of uh, one of the generals and the Joint Chiefs of Staff who had said to China, whatever provocations come, we are not at war and we want you to be clear about that. And they're saying that that was insubordinate and to which I would say he stated the truth that we were not at war. And we're not at war because a president says we're at war. And a lot of what I think we learned during this process is how dangerous it is to have a runaway chief executive. And you know, I don't have time to get into my whole thing about Congress being article one, and, and uh, you know, Congress declaring uh, war and so on. But um, you can find that. Just remember this, that Congress has the power to impeach the president. The president doesn't have the power to impeach us. So when some of my colleagues, including my beloved Nancy Pelosi, get up on the floor and they start off by saying we're three co-equal branches, I say, first of all, co-equal is not a word, okay? <laughs> uh, secondly, uh, well, why would you say that when James Madison said that Congress is the predominant branch and we overthrew a king and we had fear of what one person might do? Our nation believes in the wisdom of crowds. As dangerous as crowds can be, we would trust a lot more Congress than one person becoming president and, you know, spoiling everything. So. <laughs> I'm going to go front here. 
as long as the Congress is elected democratically, I should say, and, <laughs> and we, we haven't talked about gerrymandering yet, but. Uh, mm. Congressman, uh, my wife and I actually moved up from Bethesda a few years ago. Oh, we yeah. had the pleasure of voting for you when you took over Chris Van Hollen's seat. <laughs> well, you're always welcome back in Maryland's beautiful eight sisters. Well, <laughs> you know, we moved up because we couldn't find any neckties down there. <laughs> so, and you got a hell of a library here. There's no doubt about that. Yeah. Um, so the question I had is you, you presented an interesting thesis about how um, how societies combat authoritarian regimes, where it's really a coalition of the center right and the progressives. And, um, you know, it seems like the progressives, you know, ha have fairly solid, uh, are, are fairly solidly, um, you know, working on things. But it looks like the center right, while there's, you know, some very impressive folks like Liz Cheney and Adam Kinzinger there. Um, it looks like it's it's a bit more sparse. And so I'm wondering if you can provide some hope that you're working with some folks maybe that we're not seeing on a routine basis that may be providing a bit more of an expansive base in the center right. Well, I'll say my brother-in-law Kenneth is a Democrat now, okay. Uh, <laughs> and at least I think he's a Democrat. He's, the, he's definitely not a Republican. I don't, know, I don't know what your registration rules are here in Connecticut. But I mean, you know, I, I do. We haven't really talked about political parties and partisanship. Um, and that's a, a big subject for me and something I've thought about. And uh, no political party is perfect. Certainly mine is not perfect. Um, we, we need to open our minds and open our hearts to lots of people. Um, who maybe we've, somebody was raising before, maybe, you know, we've lost touch with, okay? Um, we've got to do that. Uh, and also, um, I, I will say, um, you know, I'm somebody, the, you know, some of the other, uh, some of my colleagues on the Democrats, I will get on my case because uh, I accept, um, well, when a state senator, I did not accept any money from corporations because I didn't think that the money from the corporation should be coming to politicians. But now I'm in Congress and they have PACs, which is you know money that comes from individuals of the corporation. And I accept that. And one of the reasons I accept it is because we want corporations on our side when the fascists try to take over our government. I want corporations to be on the progressive side of the equation, and many of them are many green corporations and environmentally positive corporations and so on. And I think that there are a lot of businesses that have been horrified by Donald Trump. And they've seen um, that not only was Trump demolishing basic constitutional boundaries and human rights, like separating parents and children uh, at the border. And you know that day in uh, Lafayette Square, they basically violated all six rights contained in the First Amendment, the freedom to assemble, the right of free speech, the right of free press as they grabbed cameras from uh, reporters, the free exercise of religion as they invaded the St. John's Church uninvited, and then they violated the establishment of religion in his own way as he took somebody else's Bible and waved it upside down over his head, uh, you know, proclaiming whatever unity of church and state he had uh, in his mind. Um, you know, um, the corporations, uh, a lot of businesses have seen that it's not just those attacks on civil liberties, but it's also the, Donald Trump trying to pick which corporations were his friends and making things happen for them in the regulatory process or supporting them, and then which ones he considered enemies and going after them. That is a hallmark of authoritarian regimes and fascism where the president decides which businesses are gonna succeed and which not, which not. That's the opposite of a free market, right? And so I think that the Democrats have got to rediscover. I think there's a great debate uh, waiting to happen I mean, it's not as big a debate as democracy versus authoritarianism, but there's a debate that needs to happen in our party about whether our tradition is properly defined as socialism 
which I know people are saying in good faith, like Bernie Sanders and my friend AOC, or is it the antitrust tradition, which is not the government taking businesses over and controlling the economy, but dividing up big businesses that are monopolizing commerce, which I think is much more the progressive tradition in America. Um, so I would you know, love to have that debate with Bernie Sanders sometime. Given what's at stake and following up on your former constituent, could you see you a, a, a race where it's uh, say Kamala Harris, Liz Cheney ticket? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I mean, after Donald Trump, I can see anything. I, you know, uh, um, I, but um, the problem when people suggest those tickets is, um, you know, somebody's going to be on top and someone's going to be number two, you know, and you're dealing with politicians. So that's a whole different breed of animal there. Um, but, uh, you know, it's very, people imagine um, third party breakaways or a party between the parties or an independent. Lots of people uh, have tried it like Ross Perot or, and I, by the way, I represented Ross Perot when he got excluded from presidential debates because I thought that was just a fundamental matter of free speech and political pluralism. Um, but, um, you know, who, well, uh, Mayor Bloomberg was trying to do it. It's very tough. Um, you know, political parties do represent whole systems of belief and values and um, interests. And the way that they, the way that you get a new party usually is one party breaks down and then gets replaced. I mean, the Republicans emerged with the breakdown of the Whigs. Um, and, um, you know, that was part of Lincoln's greatness that he could see those different elements coming together uh, to replace an antiquated and obsolete political institution. So I think that could happen, but I think it would be a replacement of the Republican Party. And it, it might start as a third party competitor to it. I mean, I, I could see, again, this is not based on any conversation or personal information, but I could see Liz Cheney running against Trump if he runs for president and he's there, the candidate of the right-wing authoritarians, her running in the primaries and maybe getting, I don't know, 30%, 25, 35, who knows? Um, and then leading a breakaway, I could see that happening. Um, I mean, I could kind of hope for that in a way, uh, <laughs> you know, because I, I, I don't, you know, I, there are a lot of Republicans who are um, sick of what they've seen, but they feel like, well, in the end, I've got to go with this. There's no alternative and there should be an alternative. I mean, the bit, I think the, the big issue that becomes, that prevents some Republicans from becoming Democrats um, is the, the choice issue. It's about abortion. And that might be, you know, even, you know, even guns, um, I think doesn't prevent people from becoming Democrats. There are a lot of people that I know who call me, they're Republicans in my district. They say, I'm gonna become a Democrat. I just wanna make sure you guys respect the second amendment. I say, I respect the second amendment, which the Supreme Court has said that people have an individual right to bear, uh, to have a gun for self-defense and for hunting and for recreation. That doesn't mean people have a right to semi-automatic assault weapons. It doesn't mean people have a right to bring guns into schools and the city councils and so on. And it also doesn't mean that we can't have um, a universal background check for violent criminals, which is supported by 90% of the people. And you know what? They all accept that. They say, fine, but what they're taught by the NRA and the GOP is that somehow there's a move to confiscate their guns. And that's just, it can't happen and it won't happen in America. So I think we can deal with that issue. But yeah, I think abortion is a trickier thing for people. Although I, I can't say that the well, anyway, we'll talk about that another time. So, so we leave on the intriguing note of Liz Cheney forming a breakaway party. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Uh, this has been that's totally imaginary. <laughs> I want to be clear about that. By the way, this isn't like televised or anything, is it? <laughs> <laughs> is it? <laughs> oh, it is. Oh, she's okay. <laughs> All right. Well, anyway, mm -hmm. a, a million thanks to <laughs> Congressman All Raskin. Right. Um, it's been a pleasure. <laughs>
Thank you very much. He'll be signing books in the lobby. His brother's, I think, giving away some ties. Um, oh, yes. <laughs> not this one, but yeah. So. <laughs> oh, what a pleasure.